My Side of the Mountain by Gene Craighead George. Day one. In which I hole up in a snowstorm. I am on my mountain in a tree home that people have passed without ever knowing that I am here. The house is a hemlock tree six feet in diameter and must be as old as the mountain itself. I came upon it last summer and dug and burned it out until I made a snug cave in the tree that I now call home. My bed is on the right as you enter and is made of ash slats and covered with deer skin. On the left is a small fireplace about knee high. It is of clay and stones. It has a chimney that leads the smoke out through a knot hole. I chipped off three other knot holes to let fresh air in. The air coming in is bitter cold. It must be below zero outside, and yet I can sit here inside my tree and write with my bare hands. The fire is small, too. It doesn't take much fire to warm this tree room. It is the 4th of December, I think. It may be the 5th. I'm not sure because I have not recently counted the notches in the aspen pole that is my calendar. I have been just too busy gathering nuts and berries, smoking venison, fish, and small game to keep up with the exact date. The lamp I am riding by is a deer fat poured into a turtle shell with a strip of my old city trousers for a wick. It snowed all day yesterday and today. I have not been outside since the storm began, and I am bored for the first time since I ran away from home eight months ago to live on the land. I am well and healthy. The food is good. Sometimes I eat turtle soup, and I know how to make acorn pancakes. I keep my supplies in the wall of the tree in the wooden pockets that I chop myself. Every time I have looked at those pockets during the last two days, I have felt just like a squirrel, which reminds me, I didn't see a squirrel one whole day before that storm began. I guess they are holed up and eating their stored nuts too. I wonder if the baron, that's the wild weasel, who lives behind the big boulder to the north of my tree, is also denned up. Well, anyway, I think the storm is dying down because the tree is not crying so much. When the wind really blows, the whole tree moans right down to the roots, which is where I am. Tomorrow, I hope the Baron and I can tunnel out in the, into the sunlight. I wonder if I should dig the snow, but that would mean I would have to put it somewhere, and the only place to put it is in my nice snug tree. Maybe I can pack it with hands, my hands as I go. I've always dug into the snow from the top, never from under. The Baron must dig up from under the snow. I wonder where he puts what he digs. Well, I guess I'll know in the morning. When I wrote that last winter, I was scared and thought maybe I'd never get out of my tree. I had been scared for two days, ever since the first blizzard hit the Catskill Mountains. When I came up into the sunlight, which I did by simply poking my head into the soft snow and standing up, I laughed at my dark fears. Everything was white, clean, shining, and beautiful. The sky was blue, blue, blue. The hemlock grove was laced with snow. The meadow was smooth and white, and the gorge was sparkling with ice. It was so beautiful and peaceful that I laughed out loud. I guess I laughed because my first snowstorm was over and it had not been so terrible after all. Then I shouted, I did it. My voice never got very far. It was hushed by the tons of snow. I looked for signs from the barren weasel. His footsteps were all over the boulder, also slides <coughs> where he had played. He must have been up for hours enjoying the new snow. Inspired by his fun, I poked my head into my tree and whistled. Frightful, my trained falcon flew to my fist, and we jumped and slid down the mountain, making big holes and trenches as we went. It was good to be whistling and carefree again, because I was sure scared by the coming of that storm. I had been working since May, learning to how to make a fire with flint and steel, finding what plants I could eat, how to trap animals and catch fish, all this so that when the curtain of blizzard struck the Catskills, I could crawl inside my tree and be comfortably warm and have plenty to eat. During the summer and fall, I had thought about the coming of winter. However, on that third day of December, when the sky blackened, the temperature dropped, and the first flakes swirled around me, I must admit that I wanted to run back to New York. Even that first night that I spent out in the woods, when I couldn't get the fire started, was not as frightening as the snowstorm that gathered behind the gorge and mushroomed up over my mountain. I was smoking three trout. It was nine o'clock in the morning. I was busy keeping the flames low so they would not leap up and burn, burn the fish. As I worked, it occurred to me that it was awfully dark for that hour of the morning. Frightful was leashed to her tree stub. She seemed restless and pulled at her tethers. Then I realized that the forest was dead quiet. Even the woodpeckers had been tapping around me all morning were silent. The squirrels were nowhere to be seen. The juncos and chickadees and nuthatches were gone. I looked to see what the barren weasel was doing. He was not around. I looked up. From my tree, you can see the gorge behind the meadow. White water pours between the black, wet, boulders and cascades into the valley below. 
The water that day was as dark as the rocks. Only the sound told me it was still falling. Above the darkness stood another darkness. The clouds of winter, black and fearsome, they looked as wild as the winds that were bringing them. I grew sick with fright. I knew I had enough food. I knew everything was going to be perfectly all right. But knowing that didn't help. I was scared. I stamped out the fire and pocketed the fish. I tried to whistle for frightful, but I couldn't purse my shaking lips tight enough to get anything but poof. So I grabbed her by the hide straps that are attached to her legs, and we dove through the deerskin door into my room in the tree. I put Frightful on the bedpost, and I curled up in a ball in the bed. I thought about New York and the noise and the lights, and how a snowstorm always seemed very friendly there. I thought about our apartment, too. At that moment, it seemed bright and lighted and warm. I had to keep saying to myself, there were 11 of us in it. Dad, mother, four sisters, four brothers, and me. And not one of us liked it, except perhaps little Nina, who was too young to know. Dad didn't like it even a little bit. He had been a sailor once, but when I was born, he gave up the sea and worked in the docks in New York. Dad didn't like the land. He liked the sea, wet and big and endless. Sometimes, he would tell me about great-grandfather Gribbley, who owned land in the Catskill Mountains and felled the trees and built a home and plowed the land, only to discover that he wanted to be a sailor. The farm failed, and great-grandfather Gribbley went to sea. As I lay with my face buried in the sweet, great, greasy smell of my deer skin, I could hear Dad's voice saying, that land is still in my family's name. Somewhere in the Catskills is an old beach with the name Gribbley carved on it. It marks the northern boundary of Gribbley's folly. The land is no place for a Gribbley. The land is no place for a Gribbley, I said. The land is no place for a Gribbley. And here I am, 300 feet from the beach, with Gribbley carved on it. I fell asleep at that point. When I w awoke, I was hungry. I cracked some walnuts, got down the acorn flour I had pounded with a bit of ash to remove the bite, reached out the door for a little snow and stirred up some acorn pancakes. I cooked them on a top of a tin can, and as I ate them, smothered with blueberry jam, I knew that the land was just the place for a gribbly, in which I started on this venture. I left New York in May. I had a pen knife, a ball of cord, an axe, and $40, which I had saved from selling magazine subscriptions. I also had some flint and steel, which I had bought at a Chinese store in the city. The man in the store had showed me how to use it. He had also given me a little purse to put it in, and some tinder to catch the sparks. He had told me that if I ran out of tinder, I should burn cloth and use the shard ashes. I thanked him and said, this is the kind of thing I am not going to forget. On the train south, north to the Catskills, I unwrapped my flint and steel and practiced hitting them together to make sparks. On the wrapping paper, I made these notes. A hard, brisk strike is best. Remember to hold the steel in the left hand and the flint in the right, and hit the steel with the flint. The trouble is the sparks go every which way. And that was the trouble. I did not get a fire going that night, and as I mentioned, this was a scary experience. I hitched rides into the Catskill Mountains. At about four o'clock, a truck driver and I passed through a beautiful dark hemlock forest, and I said to him, this is as far as I'm going. He looked all around and said, you live here? No, I said, but I am running away from home, and this is just the kind of forest I have always dreamed I would run to. I think I'll camp here tonight. I hopped out of the cab. Hey, boy, the driver shouted. Are you serious? Sure, I said. Well, now, ain't that something? You know, when I was your age, I did the same thing. Only thing was, I was a farm boy and ran to the city, and you're a city boy running to the woods. I was scared of the city. You think you'll be scared of the woods? Heck no, I shouted loudly. As I marched into the cool, shadowy woods, I heard the driver call to me. I'll be back in the morning if you want to ride home. He laughed. Everybody laughed at me, even Dad. I told Dad that I was going to run away to great-grandfather's Gribbley, Gribbley's land. He had roared with laughter and told me about the time he had run away from home. He got on a boat headed for Singapore, but when the whistle blew for departure, he was down the gangplank and home in bed before anyone knew he was gone. Then he told me, sure, go try it. Every boy should try it. I must have walked a mile into the woods until I found a stream. It was a clear, athletic stream that rushed and ran and jumped and splashed. Ferns grew along its bank, and the rocks <coughs> were upholstered with moss. I sat down, smelled the piney air, and took out my penknife. I cut off a green twig and began to whittle. I've always been good at whittling. I carved a ship once that my teacher exhibited for parents' night at school. First, I whittled an angle on one end of the twig. Then, I cut a smaller twig and sharpened it to a point. 
I whittled an angle on that twig and bound the two angle faces, angles face to face with a strip of green bark. It was supposed to be a fish hook. According to a book on how to survive on the land that I read in the New York Public Library, this was the way to make your own hooks. I then dug for worms and hardly chopped the moss away with my axe before I hit frost. It had not occurred to me that there would be frost in the ground in May, but then I had not been on a mountain before. This did worry me because I was depending on fish to keep me alive until I got to my great-grandfather's mountain, where I was going to make traps and catch game. I looked in, <coughs> into the stream to see what else I could eat, and as I did, my hand knocked a rotten log apart. I remembered of our old logs and all the sleeping stages of insects that are in it. I chopped away until I found a cold white grub. I swiftly tied a string to my hook, put the grub on, and walked up the stream looking for a good place to fish. All the manuals I had read were emphatic about where fish lived, and so I had memorized this. In streams, fish usually congregate in pools and deep calm water. The heads of riffles, small rapids, the tail of pools, eddies below rocks or logs, deep undercut banks, in the shade of over overhanging bushes, all are very likely places for fish. This stream did not seem to have any calm water, and I must have walked a thousand miles before I found a pool by a deep undercut bank in the shade of overhanging bushes. Actually, it wasn't that far. It just seemed that way because I went looking and finding nothing. I was sure I was going to starve to death. I squatted on this bank and dropped in my line. I did so want to catch a fish. One fish would set me upon my way because I had read how much you can learn from one fish. By examining the contents of its stomach, you could find what the other fish are eating, or you can use the internal organs as bait. The grub went down to the bottom of the stream. It swirled around and hung still. Suddenly, the string came to life and rode back and forth and around in a circle. I pulled with a powerful jerk. The hook came apart, and whatever I had went circling back to its bed. Well, that almost made me cry. My bait was gone, my hook was broken, and I was getting cold, frightened, and mad. I whittled, whittled another hook, but this time I cheated and used string to wind it together instead of bark. I walked back to the log and luckily found another grub. I hurried to the pool. I flipped a trout out of the water before I knew I had a bite. The fish flopped, and I threw my whole body over it. I could not bear to think of it flopping itself back into the stream. I cleaned it like I had seen the man at the fish market do, examined its stomach, and found it empty. This horrified me. What I didn't know was that an empty stomach means the fish are hungry and will eat about anything. However, I thought at the time that I was a goner. Sadly, I put some of the internal organs on my hook, and before I could get my line to the bottom, I had another bite. I lost that one, but got the next one. I stopped when I had five nice little trout and looked around for a place to build a camp and make a fire. It wasn't hard to find a pretty spot along that stream. I selected a place beside a mossy rock and a circle of hemlocks. I decided to make a bed before I cooked. I cut off some boughs for a mattress. Then I leaned some dead limbs against the boulder and covered them with hemlock limbs. This kind of made kind of tent. I crawled in, lay down, and felt alone in secret and very excited. But ah, the rest of this story. I was on the northeast side of the mountain. It grew dark and cold early. Seeing the shadows slide down on me, I frantically ran around gathering firewood. This is about the only thing I did right from that moment until dawn. Because I remembered that the driest wood in a forest is the dead limbs that are still on the trees. I gathered an enormous pile of them. That pile must still be there, for I never got a fire going. The picture says, a couple of good shelters. Make sure your fire is on scraped earth. Also, be sure to put it out. The bottom of page 16. I got sparks, sparks, sparks. I even hit the tinder with the sparks. The tinder burned all right, but that was as far as I got. I blew on it, I breathed on it, I cupped it in my hands, but no sooner did I add twigs than the whole thing went black. Then it got too dark to see. I clicked steel and flint together even though I couldn't see the tinder. Finally, I gave up and crawled into my hemlock tent, hungry, cold, and miserable. I can talk about that first night now, although it is still embarrassing to me because I was so stupid and scared that I hate to admit it. I had made my hemlock bed right in the stream valley where the wind carried down from the cold mountaintop. It had been, it might have been all right if I had made it on the other side of the boulder, but I didn't. I was right on the main highway of the cold winds as they tore down upon the valley below. I didn't have enough hemlock boughs under me, 
and before I had my head down, my stomach was cold and damp. I took some boughs off the roof and stuffed them under me. Then my shoulders were cold. I curled up in a ball and was almost asleep when a whippoorwill called. If you have ever been within 40 feet of a whippoorwill, you will understand why I couldn't even shut my eyes. They are deafening. Well, anyway, the whole night went like that. I don't think I slept 15 minutes, and I was so scared and tired that my throat was dry. I wanted a drink, but didn't dare go near the stream for fear of making a misstep and falling in and getting wet. So I sat tight and shivered and shook, and now I'm able to say I cried a little tiny bit. Fortunately, the sun was a wonderfully glorious habit of rising every morning. When the sky lightened, when the birds awoke, I knew I would never see anything so splendid as the round red sun coming up over the earth. I was immediately cheered and set out directly for the highway. Somehow, I thought that if I was a little nearer the road, everything would be all right. I climbed a hill and stopped. There was a house, a house warm and cozy, with smoke coming out the chimney and lights in the windows and only a hundred feet from my torture camp. Without considering my pride, I ran down the hill and banged on the door. A nice old man answered. I told him everything in one long sentence and then said, and so, can I cook my fish here because I haven't eaten in years? He chuckled, stroked his whiskery face, and took the fish. He had them cooking in a pan before I knew what his name was. When I asked him, he said Bill something, but I never heard his last name because I fell asleep in his rocking chair that was pulled up beside his big, hot, glorious wood stove in the kitchen. I ate the fish some hours later, also some bread, jelly, oatmeal, and cream. Then he said to me, Sam Gribbley, if you are going to run off and live in the woods, you better learn how to make a fire. Come with me. We spent the afternoon practicing. I penciled these notes on the back of a scrap paper so I wouldn't forget. When the tinder glows, keep blowing and add fine dry needles one by one. And keep blowing steadily, lightly, and evenly. Add one inch dry twigs to the needles and then give her a good big handful of small dry stuff. Keep blowing. The manner in which I find Gribbley's farm. The next day I told Bill goodbye and as I strode, warm and fed, onto the road, he called to me. I'll see you tonight. The back door will be open if you want a roof over your head. I said, okay, but I knew I wouldn't see Bill again. I knew how to make a fire, and that was my weapon. With fire, I could conquer the Catskills. I also knew how to fish. To fish and to make a fire. That was all I needed, needed to know, I thought. Three rides that morning took me to Delhi. Somewhere around here was great-grandfather's beech tree with the name Gribbley carved on it. This much I knew from Dad's stories. By six o'clock, I still had not found anyone who had even heard of the Gribblies, much less Gribblies Beach. So I slept on the porch of the schoolhouse and ate chocolate bars for supper. It was cold and hard, but I was so tired I couldn't have slept, I could have slept in a wind tunnel. At dawn, I thought real hard. Where would I find out about the Gribbley farm? Some old map, I said. Where would I find an old map? The library? Maybe. I'd try it and see. The librarian was very helpful. She was sort of young, had brown hair and brown eyes, and loved books as much as I did. The library didn't open until 10.30. I got there at 9. After I had lolled and rolled and sat on the steps for 15 or 20 minutes, the door whisked open, and this tall lady asked me to come on in and browse around until opening time. All I said to her was that I wanted to find the old Gribbley farm, and that the Gribbleys hadn't lived on it for maybe a hundred years, and she was off. I can still hear her heels click when I think of her scattering herself around those shelves finding the old maps, histories of the Catskills, and files of letters and deeds that must have come from attics around Delhi. Miss Turner, that was her name, found it. She found Gribbley's farm in an old book of Delaware County. Then she worked out the roads to it, drew me maps and everything. Finally she said, what do you want to know for? Some school project? Oh no, Miss Turner, I want to go live there. But Sam, it is all forests and trees now. The house is probably only a foundation covered with moss. That's just what I want. I'm going to trap animals and eat nuts and bulbs and berries and make myself a house. You see, I am Sam Gribbley, and I thought I would like to live on my great-grandfather's farm. Miss Turner was the only person that believed me. She smiled, sat back in her chair, and said, Well, I declare. The library was just opening when I gathered the notes we had made and started off. As I pushed open the door, Miss Turner leaned over and said to me, Sam, we have some very good books on plants and trees and animals in case you get stuck. I knew what she was thinking, and so I told her I would remember that. With Miss Turner's map, I found the first stone wall that marked the farm. The old roads to it were all grown up and mostly gone. But by locating the stream at the bottom of the mountain, I was able to begin at the bridge and go north and up a mile and a half. There, 
caterpillaring around boulders, roller coastering up ravines and down hills with the mound of rocks that had once been great grandfather's boundary fence. And then, do you know, I couldn't believe I was there. I sat on the old gray stones a long time, looking through the forest up at that steep mountain and saying to myself, it must be Sunday afternoon and it's raining and dad is trying to keep us all quiet by telling us about great grandfather's farm. And he's telling it so real that I can see it. And then I said, no, I am here because I was never this hungry before. I wanted to run all the way back to the library and tell Miss Turner that I had found it, partly because she would have liked to have known, and partly because Dad had said to me as I left, if you find the place, tell someone at Delhi. I may visit you someday. Of course he was kidding, because he thought I'd be home the next day, but after many weeks, maybe he would think I meant what I said, and he might come see me. However, I was hungry, or too hungry to run back. I took my hook and line and went back down the mountain to the stream. I caught a big old catfish. I climbed back to the stone wall in great spirits. It was getting late, and so I didn't try to explore. I went right to work making a fire. I decided that even if I didn't have enough time to cut boughs for a bed, I was going to have cooked fish and a fire to huddle around during those cold night hours. May is not exactly warm in the Catskills. By firelight, that night I wrote this. Dear Bill, that was the old man. After three tries, I finally got a handful of dry grass on the glow in the tinder. Grass is even better than pine needles, and tomorrow I'm going to try the outside of the bark of the river birch. I read somewhere that it has <coughs> combustible oil in it. And that the Indians used to start fires. Anyway, I did just what you showed me and had cooked catfish for dinner. It was good, your friend Sam. After I wrote that, I remembered I didn't know his last name, and so I stuffed the note in my pocket, made myself a bed of boughs, and leaved in the shelter of the stone wall, and fell right to sleep. I must say this now about the first fire. It was magic. Out of dead tinder and grass and sticks came a live, warm light. It cracked and snapped and smoked and filled the woods with brightness. It lighted the trees and made them warm and friendly. It stood tall and bright and held back the night. Oh, this was a different night than the first dark, frightful one. Also, I was stuffed on catfish. I have since learned to cook it more, but never have I enjoyed a meal as much as that one, and never have I felt so independent again.